Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Wednesday, July 22nd. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept, when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our lyres. For there our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem, how they said, Lay it bare, lay it bare, down to its foundations. Our New Testament reading is from Acts chapter 18. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man called Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Whenever the New Testament Gospels name the women who are with Jesus, St. Mary Magdalene is listed first, perhaps because she was the first to see the risen Savior alive. Luke 8.2 reports that Jesus had cured her of being possessed by seven demons. Through the centuries, she was often identified with the repentant woman of the city who anointed Jesus' feet as he sat at the table in the Pharisee's home. 
but there is no biblical basis for this identification of her with a penitent prostitute. Nor is she to be identified with Mary, the sister of Martha and Bethany. According to the Gospels, Mary Magdalene saw Jesus die, she witnessed his burial, and most important, she was the first to see him alive again after his resurrection. It is good for good reason that Bernard of Clairvaux calls her the Apostle to the Apostles. And tonight we begin our reading of the Augsburg Confession. At the beginning of each article, uh, there will be a brief introduction about what that article is about. Uh, the Augsburg Confession begins with a not too lengthy preface, uh, but we're not going to read that, uh, mostly because it really doesn't say anything pertinent uh, to us learning what it says. Uh, in those days when you wrote uh, one of these documents, you dedicated it to uh, your, your prince or your king, uh, so it's kind of dedicated to uh, Charles V, and it spends paragraph after paragraph uh, basically saying uh, nice titles for him and uh, basically buttering him up. Uh, so it's kind of sometimes humorous to read those, and other times it's just really, really boring. Uh, and again, there's no real content in it, so we'll skip that. Article 1, God. Note, Martin Luther never intended to start a new church, but rather to purify the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The Augsburg Confession strongly affirms the doctrine of the Trinity confessed at the Council of Nicaea in 325 and later affirmed by the Council of Constantinople in 381. God is one divine essence and three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The scriptures reveal this great mystery, confessed by all Christians. During the Reformation, radical groups espoused various forms of earlier heresies. The Augsburg Confession condemns the ancient heresies concerning God. Article 1 proves that Lutheranism is deeply anchored in the historic doctrine of biblical Christianity. It embraces the faith of the Church through all the ages and rejects all the errors the Church has rejected. Our churches teach with common consent that the decree of the Council of Nicaea about the unity of the divine essence and the three persons is true. It is to be believed without any doubt God is one divine essence who is eternal, without a body, without parts, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness. He is the maker and preserver of all things visible and invisible. Yet there are three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These three persons are of the same essence and power. Our churches use the term person as the fathers used it. We use it to signify not a part or quality in another, but that which subsists of itself. Our churches condemn all heresies that arose against this article, such as the Manichaeans, Manichaeans who assume that there are two principles, one good and the other evil. They also condemn the Valentinians, Arians, Eunomians, Muslims, and all heresies such as those. Our churches also condemn the Samosatanes, old and new, who contend that God is but one person. Through sophistry, they imply, impiously argue that the Word and the Holy Spirit are not significant persons. They say that Word signifies a spoken word, and Spirit signifies motion created in things. Article 2, Original Sin Our teacher... Our churches teach that since the fall of Adam, all who are naturally born are born with sin, that is, without the fear of God, without trust in God, and with the inclination to sin, called concupiscence. Concupiscence is a disease and original vice that is truly sin. It damns and brings eternal death on those who are not born anew through, this, through baptism in the Holy Spirit. Our churches condemn the Pelagians and others who deny the, that original depravity is sin, thus obscuring the glory of Christ's merit and benefits. Pelagians argue that a person can be justified before God by his own strength and reason. Article 3, The Son of God Our churches teach that the word that is the Son of God assumed human nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So there are two natures, the divine and the human, and separately joined in one person. There is one Christ, true God and true man, who was born of the Virgin Mary, 
truly suffered, was crucified, died, and was buried. He did this to reconcile the Father to us and to be a sacrifice, not only for original guilt, but also for all actual sins of mankind. He also descended into hell and truly rose again on the third day. Afterward, he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. There he forever reigns and has dominion over all creatures. He sanctifies those who believe in him by sending the Holy Spirit into their hearts to rule, comfort, and make them alive. He defends them against the devil and the power of sin. The same Christ will openly come again to judge the living and the dead and so forth, according to the Apostles' Creed. Article 4. Justification Our churches teach that people cannot be justified before God by their own strength, merit, or works. People are freely justified for Christ's sake through faith, when they believe that they are received into favor and that their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake. By his death, Christ made satisfaction for our sins. God counts this faith for righteousness in his sight. Article 5. The Ministry So that we may obtain this faith, the ministry of teaching the gospel and administering the sacraments was instituted. Through the word in sacraments, as through instruments, the Holy Spirit is given. He works faith when and where it pleases God, in those who hear the good news that God justifies those who believe that they are received into grace for Christ's sake. This happens not through our own merits, but for Christ's sake. Our churches condemn the Anabaptists and others who think that their own preparation and works, the Holy Spirit, comes to them without the external word. Article 6. The New Obedience Our churches teach that this faith is bound to bring forth good fruit. It is necessary to do good works commanded by God. Because of God's will, We should not rely on those works to merit justification before God. The forgiveness of sins and justification is received through faith. The voice of Christ testifies, So you also, when you have done all that you are commanded, say, We are unworthy servants, we have only done what was our duty. The fathers teach the same thing. Ambrose says, It is ordained of God that he who believes in Christ is saved, freely receiving forgiveness of sins without works, through faith alone. And we'll continue uh, with some more of the Augsburg Confession tomorrow evening. We now join in the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us, spare all the dying. From all sin, from all evil, from the devil's might, from the devil's wiles, from your wrath and from hell's torment, from sudden and evil death, good Lord, deliver them. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, help them, good Lord. In the hour of death, on the day of judgment, help them, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, good Lord, to comfort all the dying, to forgive them all their sins, to lead them out of this misery into eternal life, We implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. 
Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, restored Mary Magdalene to health and called her to be the first witness of his resurrection. Heal us from all our infirmities and call us to know you in the power of your Son's unending life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.